Olá, seja muito bem-vindo a Setembro e a mais um podcast de Fans People. Nesta rentrée trazemos-lhe uma conversa sobre a locação flexível na Europa, ou mais em concreto sobre o fundo Carminhac Portfólio Patrimônio Europe. Para isso temos hoje connosco o Luís Sancho, ele é gestor de carteiras na, na BBV Asset Management e o Luís vai conversar com o Kit Ney, da gestora francesa Carminhac. Ele é um dos três gestores que dão a cara por este fundo multiativos. Uh, esperemos que goste da próxima meia hora, uh, fico por aí. Uh, Luís, please, uh, go ahead. Ok, Margarida, thank you for this opportunity to do this podcast with Kit. Uh, hi Kit, uh, nice to have you here to exchange some ideas and talk about your fund and uh, the fund Carminhac Portfolio Patrimonio Europe, managed by your team. Perhaps the best way to start, I think it's uh, you to speak a little about that. Great. Thank you, Luis, and happy to be here. Thank you uh, for, for having me. Um, so Carmignac Patrimoine Europe is a European multi-asset fund uh, that we have been managing, Mark Denham and I, my, my, my co-manager and, uh, and head of European equities for the, over the last three and a half years. Uh, it is a, a, a fund which uh, we're very excited about uh, because we think that um, you know, investors here in Europe tend to overlook Europe. Uh, there's been also some some uh, dissatisfaction with multi-asset funds. And we're super happy the way we put this fund together, trying to marry bottom-up, long-term, fundamentally, fundamentally driven stock and bond picking, uh, but with a flexible, flexible macro overlay and a holistic risk management to make sure we try to minimize drawdowns throughout the cycle, and also doing so in a socially responsible way. Uh, the performance uh, since inception is up around 43% uh, versus a benchmark up around 24%. And we were able to do that during a very unprecedented and volatile cycle and delivering half the drawdown uh, that the benchmark had. So, so far, so good. Okay, your fund could invest until 50% in equities. Right now, it has around 30% of exposure, which it seems to me a strong bias on quality. Can we say that we are cautiously optimistic concerning economic recovery? And can I also give uh, an insight of your stock selection process along with the three, two or three examples of your main positions? Sure. So, so you're absolutely right. We're not fully invested. The equity exposure range is from zero to 50%. Um, most of this year, it's been in the high 30s. Uh, and so we're not far from that point uh, today. Uh, we definitely are an environment where we have a desynchronized global cycle. And because Europe uh, really uh, vaccinated a little bit late and reopened a little bit late, uh, it's um, a little bit further back in the reacceleration Uh, from the reopening tailwind that it still has that maybe China and the US are fading away from right now. So there's a good growth tailwind. Uh, inflation is also accelerating still uh, in Europe these days. And so, but you know, the markets are up a very material amount uh, from the bottom last year. Uh, valuations aren't necessarily uh, cheap, although we do think there are several opportunities that are, that are quite exciting. Uh, and interest rates, of course, are very low and on a real basis, even negative. So we think it's a, a positive environment for risky assets, but not one where we need to be maximum exposed okay. after a rally of 20% this year. So you're right, uh, the equity investment process is uh, one that has a bias to, to long-term secular growth stocks. Uh, this is a process that Mark has been, been uh, very disciplined and built up over the last 25 years of his career. Uh, it's a quantifiable process where he is trying to focus on high quality businesses with high return on equity, a uh, very high cash generation, but in particular business models where there's the freedom to take that cash, reinvest it in the business to make sure that the long-term growth rates are sustainable. Uh, we think that that's the best allocation of returns mm -hmm. over the long term. Now, there are uh, cycles in, in, in brief periods of time where value can bounce back from the dead uh, and we can lag a bit, <laughs> but uh, it's actually been a, a fantastic strategy and that's the core uh, bias uh, of, of the underlying fund. So that leads us to uh, names like Novo Nordisk, okay. uh, Schneider Electric. Um, it could be consumer franchises, industrial franchises. We have a focus on green energy, uh, biotech uh, disruption, ASML International uh, is an important other large uh, stock. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a good year uh, so far uh, this year, despite the fact that it's been a bit of a cyclical or value-oriented market. We've continued and are now for the fourth year in a row outperforming our, our benchmark and our peer group. 
Okay. On the bond, uh, bond bucket, I saw, and uh, from me without surprises, that your position in credit space is almost none. Can you, we say that the credit spreads are so tight that at the moment there are few opportunities to looking for? There, there is some value, but you're right. There's, there's not that much. Um, it has been, uh, of course, not just an extraordinary rally post the COVID sell-off, uh, but we've had negative interest rates in, in Europe for the last seven years. And so investors are reaching for yield. Uh, financial repression is about taxing savers and taking, taking risk-free duration out of the market and forcing everyone to push risk premia down in other asset classes. So we find investment grade and high yield in Europe expensive. Um, there are some pockets of value, but we felt that we were going to have a bear market this year in bonds, that it would make sense to reduce credit and reduce spread product overall to have the risk budget available to properly hedge uh, for rising interest rates. Uh, and that's worked very well for us so, so far this year. And the bond contribution to the fund is, uh, is up around two points versus a benchmark that's down around one. Um, government bonds, of course, uh, were down around four and a half percent at the peak. Investment grade corporate credit is only modestly positive. And high yield bonds, of course, are up uh, a little bit over 3%. But our equity allocation has done much, much better than that. So we prefer to keep the corporate risk where we have a better risk reward uh, on the equity side. You touch on government. And uh, I saw that uh, you increase uh, duration a little bit on the last few months from a negative or virtual zero to almost three years. Can you comment on that? Sure. So we, we did have a negative duration for the first uh, five months of the year, and we're able to preserve capital during that uh, bear market and government bonds. Uh, and we did decide in June and July to increase that exposure. Uh, clearly, there are some, some mixed messages in terms of the global cycle, and this desynchronization has also been a bit uh, confusing. So with China slowing down, with U.S. Uh, growth needing to normalize coming off of this uh, stimulus-driven sugar high, uh, we felt that uh, this decelerating of the global growth cycle, not necessarily in Europe, but globally, uh, would be a bit of a headwind. And the fact that the ECB was moving into its strategic review and were likely to uh, reinforce their forward guidance, and they did, that there was room for, for bonds to rally back after what was one of the worst bear markets in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't talk about that modest increase of yields uh, from the, the, the vaccine uh, news back in November up until say May of this year as being a big bear market, but the duration of the government bond market today is at an all time high, around eight points. 20 years ago, the duration of the overall benchmark was only around four points. Mm -hmm. So it only takes a very small increase of yields to cause a very dramatic uh, loss of capital. Um, but we have once again, reduced the duration a little bit uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, it is something that we need to manage very flexibly. And uh, we're coming into a, a, a tougher period here where the growth slowdown of the summer is probably past and the ECB might need to dial back its uh, monetary support. Okay. I have also noticed that your fund uh, has an article eight concerning SIG criteria. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? It, it is an article eight uh, registered fund. It also has uh, been approved by the Belgian government and the French government for their SRI and ESG labels in those two respective uh, countries. Uh, it is a sustainable product and it's an important and integrated part of the investment process across equities, government bonds, as well as corporates. Uh, now we do uh, address the different asset classes in a different way, uh, but we have all of our positions are scored and ranked. And on the equity side, we maintain a very high ESG uh, rating uh, for the fund. On the bond side, we have a negative filtering process that is very strict, knocking out uh, polluting uh, uh, sectors, uh, energy sectors, not just non-conventional but conventional energy production as well and we knock out anything that would really rank below uh, a single b or in the c range for the msci uh, esg ratings so the ov overall fund is um is uh, is running a very esg focused uh, mindset okay finally in your opinion what are the possible headwinds that we should take into account in a near term if any well, I think, as I mentioned, uh, first up, it's going to be for the ECB possibly reducing its uh, quantitative easing program. But we're in a market today in a cycle that is completely unprecedented. And we've benefited from an unprecedented amount of fiscal and monetary support. And so a reduction of this liquidity support for markets is going to be the most important um, headwind for risky assets. And that's across all asset classes. And the one underlying factor that is allowing governments to be as uh, aggressive 
and to have as loose a policy as they have today is the current uh, assumption of the transitory nature of inflation. And so if we were to see um, once the reopening pent up demand and the bottlenecks were to die off, because those absolutely are mm -hmm. transitory by definition and goods inflation, for example, in the United States were to moderate. But if we were to see some more persistent uh, drivers of inflation perk up and we're concerned about the fact that shelter inflation in the United States is dramatically underappreciated and underestimated in the current CPI calculations, we do think that the Fed is assuming the labor market slack is possibly uh, larger than what it actually is on an underlying basis. And so wage pressure might continue to be stronger than what the Fed is expecting. And we saw that in the average hourly earnings numbers that were released uh, about a week ago. And so if we're to have more persistent, longer term uh, services inflation, that's going to put pressure on central banks, not just the Fed, but central banks worldwide to reduce the amount of monetary support and that's gonna be a headwind for markets. And so it's one of the reasons as, as your first question noticed that we're, uh, we're not fully invested on the equity side that we want to be um, exposed to the, the positive uh, uh, scenario that we have today, but we're cautious about what could come in 2022. And we're gonna be um, uh, reflecting that in a more conservative asset allocation. Since you have some minutes to, to speak uh, about these teams, how do you see German elections and the possibility of a new coalition come to power? Uh, I think that uh, the ESPD with the Greens could be a push for uh, green, green economics in Europe and uh, provide a, a very, very strong case to that. You're absolutely right. That's a good point to bring up, Lewis. Not only would it uh, be supportive of green economics, it would probably be uh, a game changer and otherwise over the last decade, a focus on fiscal austerity. So the election is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, the CDU, uh, CSU uh, continues to drop in the polls. Now we can't with a very high conviction uh, tell you uh, which coalition uh, it's gonna be. Uh, there's so several different combinations mm -hmm. uh, that could still come out of this race, but it does open up on the probability distribution of outcomes. Uh, again, the possibility for loose fiscal policy, uh, the possibility for even more reinforcement of the green uh, investments, as you mentioned, which is something that's going to be important to tailwind to part of our equity uh, stock picking, uh, be it Vestas on the wind side, uh, Orsted on the um, Vestas on the turbine manufacturing, Orsted on the wind farms, uh, Solera um, on the on the solar side. Uh, these are businesses that have a good tailwind from fiscal green spending, and that could be accentuated. Uh, but importantly, on the bond side, I mentioned to you. Um, why we reduced over the last month that duration exposure back down towards zero again. And we talked about you know, the fact that the strategic review um, has been uh, put in place and there is new dovish forward guidance, but this German election is really an important milestone for Europe and for European integration and for factors that could lead to more fiscal policy and factors that could be a little bit of a tailwind to the ECB, even though their forward guidance on interest rates was quite dovish and quite robust, that they will be wait, patiently waiting for their inflation target to be met. Uh, but that the QE uh, asset purchase program is not tied to the same forward guidance. And if we do have a pickup of the cycle, if we do have a more uh, fiscally generous coalition in Germany, uh, we could have a justification for higher interest rates, for steeper curves, for less quantitative easing and less liquidity support uh, from the ECB. And so this is an important driver, not just of the, again, the equity thematics, but of having a zero duration today versus a benchmark, which is a little bit over four points of duration. So we think that uh, yields are at risk, and that's something we need to be uh, quite attentive to, to try to manage, again, another uh, bear market in bonds. We can say that in an extreme case, and obviously this is an exaggeration, but the Bund can no longer be the risk-free asset in Europe. It's absolutely a difficult environment to manage risk and to manage down cycles when our risk-free asset is not offering, not only of course a negative nominal return, but a very dramatic, dramatic negative real return. Um, and if, if the cycle uh, were to, to go bad, there's no protection. Uh, by owning bonds uh, as a balance to a riskier assets. That's why I think it's important that flexibility and having a very broad toolkit and having the courage to use that toolkit and having the courage to go negative duration uh, to preserve capital in these very difficult markets is important to navigate this, uh, this unprecedented cycle. Uh, so I think this election is gonna be a key point and we could see uh, higher boon yields and steeper curves um, because of it. Okay. 
I think that uh, that's it. It was a useful conversation. I don't know if uh, Margarida wants to make the final remarks. And uh, it was a pleasure to me to do this podcast with you, Kit. Thank you for your time, Luis. That was great.